Good day, ENG2D. We're going to continue on today taking a look at the summaries for Acts 1 through 5 of Macbeth. So please turn to the section in your study package near the end where there is a closed procedure opportunity to fill in the blanks. All right, take, let's take a look here at Act 1, Scene 1. Three witches plan to meet Macbeth after a battle that is in progress. All right, so again, these witches here, also known as the Fates or the Mori, um, again, Greek mythology, um, and these are mythological fi uh, figures that control the destiny of, of humans. They control it by um, cutting the thread to their lives. Mm -hmm. Now, these witches are sometimes called the weird sisters. And again, this word weird comes from the uh, Anglo-Saxon word weird, uh, which means fate. So in other words, these witches are foretellers of fate. The question is, do they tell the future or are they actually creating the situations that they talk of? Or is something else in charge of the um, the situations, right? For most of the play, it seems that they are just simply telling the future, that they are oh, just simply aware of what's going to happen. Um, however, some, some critics suggest that they are actually um, contributors to the outcome as well. They have a, a bigger part to play in it. This is a very effective start to the play. We have the sound and light effects of a storm, some mysterious creatures, and a disappearing trick as the witches vanish in the mist. Now again, this is their kind of signature move um, as they disappear, right? Um, again, connecting these witches though with the powers of darkness, the ability to um, do magical things like disappear and tell the future. Act 1, Scene 2. A wounded captain brings King Duncan news of Macbeth's victories. Duncan condemns Cawdor, the original Cawdor, um, who assisted Sweno, King Sweno, and Macdonwald, Sweno again was the king of Norway, who assisted with this um, revolution, the rebel, uh, the rebel army. So again, we have Scotland at war with itself with a rebel ar army. So Duncan, the, the first uh, king, condemns Cawdor, the traitor, to death by hanging. Now, when you are a traitor, um, Typically, for noblemen, the, um, the death sentence was by hanging. And he confers his title, he gives his title to Macbeth. Now, this is um, the first real truth that is told. The witches give, uh, are going to give, uh, or have given, Macbeth three prophecies. The prophecy that he uh, is going to be Thane of Glams, which he already is. That he is going to be Thane of Cawdor, which he will soon be at the time and now is. And suggests that he will be king hereafter. Um, so again, in order to, um, and Banquo says this, right? In order to get humans to believe them, they tell little half-truths. Now, when you tell a half-truth, it's called equivocation. Notice how Shakespeare makes us wait before Macbeth appears and we can judge him for ourselves. However, there are going to be a lot of um, characters that are going to present him as being very noble, very honorable, very capable. So we, you know, f from, from their descriptions, we see him as a very honorable, very, very capable man. We hear about him from people who obviously admire and respect him. Duncan describes him as a worthy gentleman. Now, again, here we have um, some irony for sure. We know that um, at some point, Macbeth is going to prove himself to be so much less than a gentleman. 
whilst the captain calls him Brave Macbeth. Now, at the beginning here, it's necessary for our character, for our main character, our protagonist, to be of high standing. And we took a note on this when we were talking about um, tragedy, according to Aristotle, and Shakespeare's version of tragedy, and Shakespeare's version of the tragic hero. So according to Shakespeare, his tragic heroes were of high standing or of high noble birth, certainly had some position and respect and honor. And this is necessary because um, how do you have a downfall if you're not of high standing, right? So again, this is necessary to be of high standing so that the character can face and experience a downfall. And again, this is one of the main points of um, or definitions of tragic hero. Act 1, scene 3. Macbeth and Banquo meet the witches upon the heath. The witches salute Macbeth with the predictions that he will become Thane of Cawdor and King of Scotland. When challenged by Banquo, uh, they predict that although he will not become king himself, he will father a line of kings. Um, so again, here we see that the witches are telling a little bit of truth um, in order to blind the characters. Does it work? You bet it does. Uh, certainly right off the bat for Macbeth. Um, Banquo is a little bit hesitant, is kind of doubtful. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, when, the, when the witches give the predictions, Banquo shares, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. So in other words, this idea that um, the witches are telling possibly half-truths in order to blind us and convince us that they are telling the truth, when in fact they very well might not be. This is a scene to really draw the audience into the play, especially if that audience believes in the power and danger of the supernatural. There are ritual chants and dances along with another, and we already established this, this is their kind of signature uh, move, uh, the witch's disappearing tricks. Macbeth's speech, so foul and fair a day I have not seen, is an eerie echo of the witch's earlier fair is foul and foul is fair. Now again, this shows that he is by this point already under their control. Now some critics have suggested that Macbeth has been under their control for a very long time. The uh, There's going to be a lot of um, characters who suggest that Macbeth that Macbeth was so incredibly brave um, and that by all intents and purposes, he maybe should have should have died on that battlefield. Some critics suggest that the witches were protecting him so that they could play a little game with him and have fun with him, you know. So um, not sure about that, but certainly by this point, he is under their control because he is echoing their words. He's in line with them. Note the different reactions, though, of Banquo and Macbeth to the fortune telling. So Macbeth here says to the witches, stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. And this shows us that Macbeth believes them. He believes that they are real. He believes that, uh, that they are telling the truth. He wants to know more. But if you look at Banquo's initial uh, reaction here, he's doubtful. He says, you know, were such things here? Like, did, did, did we really, you know, see witches and did they really disappear? So he thinks, he's questioning, have we eaten on the insane root? Like, have we eaten some poisonous plant that has made us um, see things that aren't there? Um, so again, so he is kind of doubtful, whereas Macbeth is not, he believes. Let's keep going here. Act one, scene four. Mal Malcolm reports the execution of this original Thane of Cawdor um, to King Duncan. Macbeth enters and is welcomed home as a hero. So again, he must be of high standing. He, um, he must be of high standing, as I said, because 
only then can he have his great downfall and become uh, this tragic hero. Now, I want to point out to you, even though Banquo and Macbeth react differently initially to the predictions, they both have ambition. And in a way, you could argue that ambition is actually both their tragic flaws. For Macbeth, of course, his ambition directly leads to him killing the king and wanting to stay safe on that on that throne. But for Banquo, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, um, Banquo has ambition as well. He wants to know what the witch's um, predictions are for him, right? And he 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 prompts them to address his future. So he does have ambition. A little bit later on, when he has the opportunity um, to tattle on Macbeth, he doesn't. Even though he has strong, strong feelings that maybe Macbeth achieved the, the throne um, by not so honorable ways. Okay, so again, Macbeth enters and is welcomed home as a hero. Duncan announces that his son Malcolm will be the heir to the throne, right? The Prince of Cumberland um, then states his intentions to visit Macbeth at Inverness Castle. Macbeth leaves and broods over Malcolm's elevation. So again, Macbeth thinks this is a bit of a roadblock. And he even suggests that this is something that he must try to figure out or else overleap it. Somehow get over this, this fact that Malcolm is next in line. Cotter's execution makes it clear that those who betray the king, what the what those who betray the king can expect. Duncan then gives us a line to remind us to mistrust what we see. And so here we have, again, an introduction to one of the main themes running through the play, and that is the theme of appearance versus reality. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. In other words, you can't just look at somebody's face and know whether you can trust them or not. There's no way to tell. There's no like strategy that you can use to, to tell whether somebody is trustworthy or not. And in fact, Duncan goes on to say, he was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. And now what's interesting to note is he is talking initially about Cawdor, the first Cawdor, who betrayed him, but it also um, fits the second thing of Cawdor Macbeth, right? Because Duncan also had an absolute trust in him as well. Okay, let's turn the page over here. Again, if uh, I am going too fast for you to fill in the blanks, just simply stop the video and then restart it when you need to. Act 1, Scene 4. Lady Macbeth reads Macbeth's letter, informing her of the witch's predictions. She is determined that he will be king and her queen. Now again, she is not the typical Elizabethan woman, or sorry, medieval woman even. Um, <clears throat> she uh, is not just nurturing and feminine. She, in fact, takes control. Right? And again, this is not your typical woman for the age. In fact, she is uh, quite, um, quite to the point here. She says, unsex me here. Take away my gender. Right? This has nothing to do with procreation. She's suggesting, take away my female gender and make me more male so that I can um, do whatever has to be done in order to ensure my husband ascends the throne. So again here, <clears throat> she's quite Machiavellian herself, right? Willing to do whatever it takes to get a final end. In fact, she says, unsex me, take away my gender so much that you take my milk for gall. So gall is bile, in other words. It's bitter in the gallbladder. Um, a substance that's bitter from the gall batter. So she's saying, take my milk for gall, make it bitter. So this suggests that they have lost a child very recently. Um, and again, this is important to note because they have no children. Macbeth's line, if he should ever make it to the throne, and we know that he does, 
has no children to continue the line on the throne. Um, again, this suggests she's lost a child very recently because her milk is still flowing. Um, it takes, you know, that eventually stops. But the fact that it's still flowing here suggests that their child died perhaps uh, from, an, from an illness um, or maybe in childbirth. We never, we never do find out. A messenger brings news of the king's visit and she calls upon the powers of darkness to destroy in her any feminine qualities. Again, yeah, unsex me here. Take away my gender. When Macbeth arrives, she greets her husband and urges him to hide his intentions behind an appearance of hospitality. Again, you must look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. And again, this is an introduction to that uh, one of the main themes of appearance versus realities. Things that appear to be good are, are not. Fair is foul <clears throat> and foul is fair. We are presented with contrast, with a contrast. The brave warrior seen as a married man um, and Lady Macbeth seems to understand her husband far better than any of the soldiers and nobles. Now this contrast is going to flip a little bit later on, right? So we have the brave warrior um, who is seen as a married man and Lady Macbeth um, being very understanding and supportive, right? She knows there is a milk of human kindness in Macbeth as well as ambition. So she's actually worried here that he's too kind to do what it what it what has to be done. She's not sure he is capable of being Machiavellian, right? Doing whatever has to be done to get the end result. Although he is ambitious, he doesn't have the uh, the drive to really follow through. So she knows that she is going to have to take charge here and um, support him in that, or he'll give up. Uh, next act here. Uh, sorry, next scene here, Act 1, Scene 4. The king and his lords arrive at Macbeth's castle and are welcomed by Lady Macbeth. The king is old, frail, and trusting. Now, we've already established that because Duncan was so trusting, uh, that was his fatal flaw, right? The fact that he was trusting of the, the original Thane of Cawdor and now is equally as trusting of this new Thane of Cawdor. Macbeth. He did not learn his lesson, and it does bring him to his own downfall. He speaks kindly of Macbeth. We love him highly. So again, yeah, establishing that he is too trusting here. And shall continue our graces towards him, making the latter's subsequent treachery even worse. Yeah, the fact that Macbeth is even considering this, it's all the worse. Macbeth knows that he owes Duncan, his guest, loyalty as a relative and as God's choice as king. So again, so not only is Duncan his guest, he's also a relative and he's also God's choice as king. Now again, this was established in the chain of being, in the divine right of kings, that whoever was a natural king was a king because that's the way that God wanted it to be. So introducing this idea that if you are an unnatural king, you don't belong there. Um, and again, the idea that if there is, um, you know, some kind of break in the chain of being, the result would be chaos in the natural world. And we do see that happen throughout the play. Act one, scene, uh, scene Sorry, this is scene four, five, and six. Uh, Macbeth has withdrawn from the banquet and is in a guilt-ridden, or gives a guilt-ridden soliloquy where he decides not to proceed with the murder. But Lady Macbeth persuades him to change his mind by taunting him with cowardice. Again, yeah. So she emotionally um, comes right out and abuses him, right? Taunts him. And she says she would rather kill her own child rather than break a promise to him. So again, she's she's getting pretty um, pretty nasty here 
they've just lost a child. And the fact that she is going to bring this up about killing her own child um, is pretty strategic, actually, isn't it? We see here the beginnings of this flip. At the beginning, we saw Macbeth as very brave. Um, Lady Macbeth, we assumed she was a, a typical woman, nurturing and supportive. But here, we do see this flip where Macbeth has become soft and it is Lady Macbeth that becomes hardened. This soliloquy is our first real insight into what makes Macbeth tick. At this point, he's not a true full monster, but just simply a man who has some monstrous thoughts. He has a clear sense of right and wrong, and this is important to point out because at this point, he knows it's wrong to kill the king, right? For these three reasons, his get, he's a guest, he's a relative, and he's the divine king. Now, some people argue that Lady Macbeth um, is responsible for the whole tragedy in that she convinces him and emotionally abuses him to the point where he actually follows through. However, it is important to note that she didn't plant the idea of murder. As soon as the witches uh, gave their predictions, the idea of killing the king flashed in his mind and he actually you know was thinking about it for a little while after that as well sorry just a drink of water there <clears throat> okay so yeah so he knows what's right and wrong believing an offense against duncan is an offense against god so again here he's referring to the chain of being the divine right of kings. His better side is on the verge of winning out when his wife gives him the extra push, sorry, push toward the forces of darkness. Yeah, does it work? We know it does. She, um, you know, demasculine, uh, demasculinates, or demasculine, yeah, demasculinates, um, or demasculinizes anyways we'll, we'll double check that demasculine he she um makes him feel less masculine let's put it that way Macbeth he gets to the point where he says yes I agree with you false face must hide what the false heart doth know yeah so he understands he is convinced and he is committed yep I will do this I will put on a false face and hide what's really going on underneath inside of me in my heart the fact that I want to kill the king uh, I'm going to hide it again this is a reiteration of the um, theme of appearance versus reality act two scene one unable to sleep Banquo paces the castle with his son Fleance they meet Macbeth who denies ever thinking about the three witches which is a downright lie it's practically the only thing he has been thinking about since they told him the predictions. After Banquo returns to his chambers, Macbeth has a vision of a blood-soaked dagger pointing toward the king's bedroom and he actually takes this vision as an indication that he should go through with this because it's kind of guiding him toward the king's bedroom. A bell tolls and he goes to com commit the murder. Now this bell tolling is um, a pre-arranged sign uh, between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth that um, everything's ready uh, for him to go and kill the king. <clears throat> Notice the contrast between the two men who can't sleep. Macbeth, unlike Banquo, is driven by the witch's predictions. Even though he says he hasn't even thought about them, he has definitely. Think about what the dagger, think about what the dagger that he sees or thinks he sees means. It, sorry, is it a sign of guilty conscience or that he is possessed by evil or supernatural forces? Could it be both? For sure, right? He, he is battling his guilt still at this time. A little bit later on, this conscience is going to, to, to be, you know, not even, not even visible. 
Um, is he possessed by evil or supernatural forces? Certainly, we've suggested that he is under the control of the witches, right? He reiterates um, their sentiments, you know, by, by suggesting he has not seen such, you know, um, a, a, a foul day. Okay. So yes, notice both men, though, have ambition as their fatal flaw. And we'll get into this a little bit later as well. Now, it's important to establish that Macbeth, sorry, that Shakespeare wrote Macbeth as a huge compliment, actually, to King James. When Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, she did not have an heir. She had no children. And so her closest relative was King James, but he was already king of, of Scotland, King James VI of Scotland. And so he actually uh, was king of England and Scotland and actually Ireland as well. Very powerful man. So Shakespeare <clears throat> is giving King James a huge compliment here because it was said that King James was an ancestor of Banquo. And we'll get into that a little bit um, a little bit more specifically as we continue. So again, Banquo must be shown in a good light, in a positive light, to again uh, be a, a huge compliment here for King James. Okay, let's continue here. Act two, scene two. Lady Macbeth waits nervously for Macbeth to return from the king's chamber. <clears throat> <clears throat> he enters in a daze. So, is this PTSD? And we did discuss this before, right? Is he suffering from PTSD? Certainly um, being unsure and having your reservations about killing someone and then having to go through with it would lead you to have some trauma. So again, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, in addition to losing a child. Right. So um, you could definitely argue that he's in a daze. He's in PTSD. His hands are covered in blood. Again, we've mentioned before that blood here does represent guilt. It is um, imagery. Uh, muttering about his inability to say amen. Now, the fact that he can't say amen links him even further, uh, even more strongly um, with the witches and seems to support the fact that they have some control over him. Uh, in his confused state, he has brought the daggers with him. And, you know, Lady Macbeth is not impressed with this, right? Lady Macbeth takes them back herself when Macbeth refuses. So again, we see some, some more of this, uh, you know, role reversal kind of back and forth. Macbeth here actually seems to be a bit of a pathetic figure in that he can't even be manly enough to go and make right his mistake. He needs his wife to do that. And she steps up to the plate. Lady Macbeth then returns, her hands also covered in blood. Again, we have um, blood imagery representing how guilty she is. And she persuades her husband to prepare to meet the guests as if they have just been woken. So again, she's saying, let's pretend what is, is not. Appearance versus reality. The scene ends with someone knocking at the castle gate. Now again, we've established here that the killing of Duncan is what is referred to as the first great crime. As we know, there are going to be three. Lady Macbeth admits that she could not kill Duncan because he reminded her of her father. Now, this is important to note because she still has access to her own emotions at this point, even though she is trying very, very desperately to shut off her emotions, to become cold hearted, uh, to become more like, a, a, you know, a man. Um, Shakespeare shows us that even a scheming partner in a murder plot has feelings. Yeah, and at this point, she does certainly have access to them. Both husband and wife are nervous and guilty, but it is Lady Macbeth who manages to overcome their qualms. She says, you do unbend your noble strength to think so, so brain sickly of things. Go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. So she's suggesting here, um, man up. Like, stop being such a wuss. Stop 
thinking of you know what has happened just get it out of your mind and we're going to wash this this our guilt away here basically she thinks this is going to be something very simple to do but as we know um later on in the play she actually cannot get this out of her own mind and she relives this nightly in her sleepwalking Again, people who committed monstrous and evil acts are shown at this time to have feelings, to have access to feelings. And so again here, we see that the characters, particularly the main characters here, are rounded. We call these characters rounded as they are fully developed. A flat character doesn't, doesn't have development. Um, so these characters here are able to be both good and evil and, you know, have kind of, um, you know, different uh, emotions about things, um, whereas a flat character is just one-dimensional. Okay, Act 2, Scene 3. The castle porter goes to open the gates, imagining himself to be the porter of hell. Now, again, this is the only comic relief scene, and it also includes body humor. And we talked about this when we... Um, examine the actual play body humor is when um there's lots of sexual innuendo and uh, it's not b-o-d-y body humor but b-a-w-d-y and the elizabethan audience would find this you know very engaging and hilarious um macduff and lennox enter Macbeth greets them as if he had been awoken by their knocking again here appearance versus reality fair is foul and foul is fair. And then shows Macduff to the king's room, like he, he, you know, has no idea the king has been killed. Lennox describes the strange events of the night, um, but then Macduff returns horrified by the murder of the king. So again, here we know the chain of being has been disrupted, and um, this has... Um, been evidenced in the natural world, right? The strange events of the night, some crazy things have happened. Again, it had already been disrupted. Macduff, again, returns horrified by the murder. Macbeth and Lennox go to see them for themselves while Macduff rouses the castle, wakes everybody up. Lennox report, reports that the murderers appear to have been the two guards. Again, fair is foul and foul is fair. Who appears foul is actually fair, and who appears fair is actually foul. Whom Macbeth has now admitted to killing, which is which was just so silly of him. An action he defends by his fury at the sight of the dead king. Now, because his um, explanation that he killed the guards is so ridiculous... Um, Lady Macbeth needs to create a distraction and she does she faints and certainly at this time when a lady fainted the men would be gentlemen and would go to her aid was it a distraction does it work it certainly does it takes the focus off of how ridiculous Macbeth's claims are now at first of course he's saying oh I don't uh, everything's fine and next he says Oh, I know they killed the king, so I killed them. Just ridiculous. The king's sons plan to escape as they fear for their own lives. Very smart of them. They are not too trusting. And that's an important point to note. Malcolm explains that he's going to go to England and Donald Bain goes to Ireland. And they rightly express that they're going to be a lot safer if they are separated, right? Right. If somebody tracks them down, they can't, you know, they wouldn't be able to uh, kill them both. Shakespeare continues to show Lady Macbeth as a skillful deceiver. She uses her womanly wiles to mislead, saying, help me, hence, ho. And again, this is where she faints, right? May Lady Macbeth to the rescue again. This is not the last time uh, that she is going to rescue Macbeth. Uh, before appearing to faint. She seems cleverer than Macbeth in dealing with people and situations. Yeah, again, this flips, though, as we get to the end, right? He takes, he takes big, big charge of things. Act 2, Scene 4. 
Ross and an old man discuss strange unnatural events of the night. So again, the chain of being has been disrupted and the natural world has been thrown into chaos. Again, this is something that the Elizabethans would naturally interpret. They would, they would be well aware of this. Macduff enters and informs them that Duncan's sons have been accused of bribing the two guards. So again, fair is foul and foul is fair. Appearance versus reality. He also reports that Macbeth will be crowned king. Macduff will not attend the coronation. This is a bad move for him, right? We know that this gets Macbeth very suspicious and eventually you know, prompts him to um, his third great crime, to kill his family. The reports of unnatural events are a reminder that Duncan's murder is more than an offense against the law. It's not just against the law. It has, it's something that has consequences beyond this life, disrupting the natural order. Yeah, the chain of being. Now, it's important to note from this point on, Macbeth's life will be filled with suspicion. He is going to be quite insecure, doesn't know who to trust, not what he thought it would be. Yeah, this whole experience of being king is certainly not what he thought it would be. Reminiscent of, be careful what you wish for. Act three, scene one. Banquo secretly believes that Macbeth gained the throne by evil means. <clears throat> so, um, if he had this, you know, this intuition, he should have done something about it, right? But his own ambition, you know, prevents him from doing this. He wants to make sure that his own son gets to the throne. So his ambition leads to his downfall as well. But remembers that the witches prophesied that he would be a father of a line of kings. Macbeth then arranges for two murderers to kill Banquo and his son, Fleance, while they are out riding. Now this is important to note. Macbeth and Banquo were really tight. They were good friends, maybe even best friends. He cannot do it himself. He's, he cannot kill his, his best friend. And so he hires two murderers to do it. And eventually, he even sends in a third one for good measure. He needs Banquo killed. And because he can't be there himself, he must have insurance for that. Banquo tells Macbeth, thou hast it now. King, Cawdor, Glams, all. And again, this prompts him to think, well, oh, maybe he didn't gain this um, honorably. Notice, however, that becoming king has not brought happiness or power. Macbeth still needs murderous thugs to help him and is worried that what he's gained may be taken from him. Yeah, he, he becomes grow like more and more and more and more um, insecure. He grows his insecurity. He is unable to enjoy what he's gained because he feels so insecure. Exactly. Act three, scene two. Lady Macbeth and her husband feel their security is under threat, constantly um, insecure. Macbeth shares his mistrust of Banquo and Fleance and informs his wife that a dreadful deed will soon be committed that evening, but he reveals no details of what that will be. Now, at the beginning, the very, you know, back to uh, when he first got the predictions, he sends his wife a letter um, suggesting that they are a team and that he he trusts her implicitly. By this point, though, we see that the marriage might be starting to break down a little bit, right? In that he is not going to tell her what he's doing. So he is hiding things from her. They're not so open as they once were. Macbeth shows, sorry, Shakespeare shows Macbeth increasingly insecure and disturbed. The image of his mind as full of scorpions, which is imagery, right? Really good imagery too. If you, we said before that imagery is if you close your eyes and you can see a word picture, then you know that you have encountered imagery. And again, this is really good imagery. It suggests squirming restlessness and poisonous discomfort. Yeah, his mind is full of humongous 
toxic, squirming, poisonous angst. Um, at some stage, though, he is going to feel nothing. He is going to just shut down all emotion. Can't handle it. Now, again, that is um, a big, big symptom of PTSD, right? Where you just feel nothing. You feel numb. Um, Act 3, Scene 3. The two murderers are joined by a third. Again, we know Macbeth is insecure that the job won't get done. And so he sends this third. He knows he can't do it himself. He can't be there to ensure it happens. Banquo is killed, but his son escapes. Again, a compliment to King James. And we're going to explain that a little bit more, uh, a little bit later. Now, here we have the second great crime that he has killed his best friend, his close um, you know, general in the army, another general in the army. The murder of Banquo, a friend, makes Macbeth seem more evil. Absolutely. He is spiraling down into, you know, monstrous behavior. His failure to kill Fleance, meanwhile, makes him seem less in control. He's, you know, a little bit, he's a little bit, he's more than a little bit irked by this. However, he does kind of rationalize it. A banquet is held at Macbeth's castle. Macbeth welcomes the Thanes. The first murderer reports the death of Banquo. And this pleases Macbeth um, quite a lot, right? He, he needs to make sure that the job gets done. But he also reports the escape of Fleance. Macbeth consoles himself that Fleance is too young to do him any harm. He'll track him down later. When he enters the banquet, the sight of Banquo's ghost sitting in Macbeth's place appalls him and he is unable to conceal his horror. Yeah, so he is, um, he's starting to lose his grip on reality. Again, maybe some huge PTSD. I'm sure killing your best friend um, and trying to kill his son, you know, would cause some trauma. Absolutely. The banquet ends in chaos as Lady Macbeth ushers the guests out. So again here, we see Lady Macbeth to the rescue. He's losing his, his grip on reality and Lady Macbeth needs to clean up his blunder. Macbeth decides to visit the witches the next day for some more direction. If Banquo's ghost is real, then it shows how events in life can have effects after life. If the ghost is Macbeth's imagination, we never do... You know, the um, the script itself doesn't dictate to us whether this is a real uh, a real ghost or whether it's just Macbeth's imagination. And in fact, different directors choose to portray that differently depending on their understanding of the plot. But one thing he does show is that he is losing his grip on reality, for sure. Either way, the act of killing Duncan has led to more than Macbeth bargained for. Absolutely. This is not the experience that he thought he would, um, that he would have. In this scene, Lady Macbeth seems more in control than her husband. Again, we see that flip, right? She is not the typical woman. She's quite masculine. In fact, she has asked the instruments of darkness to take her gender away from her. All right, let's keep going here. Um, act three, scene four. Hecate, the goddess of the witches, rebukes them for speaking to Macbeth, um, is not pleased. Yeah, she chastises them because they did not involve her. She vows to punish Macbeth for his overconfidence. Now, what's interesting is the witches have planted this overconfidence, but Hackett says, I'm going to take this overconfidence to a new level. And she suggests Macbeth is going to, he shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. So she's suggesting here that with her involvement now, again, she's going to take this to a new level. He is going to look at faith and, you know, not be worried about it. Uh, also, he's not going to be worried about dying. And he is going to hold on to his hopes, his security, even though it's not wise or graceful or even 
based in reality. And she says, and you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. So again, we're going to see this at the end, um, how Macbeth does hold on to a feeling of security. And that does bring him, you know, certainly contributes to his downfall. This scene has significant potential for special effects. Hackett and the witches have music and songs before their trademark disappearing trick. Okay, let's move on here. Act three, scene five. Lennox describes Macbeth's tyranny to another lord who reports that Macbeth has led, sorry, Macduff has fled to England to join forces with Malcolm. We know this was a bad move on his part. He should not have left his, his child and his wife alone in the castle. Yeah, it, it leads to the third great crime, right? It's a clear oversight on his part. Maybe he too was suffering with some PTSD and wasn't able to make some really sound decisions here. Okay, so he goes off to England to join Malcolm. Um, Macduff is seeking English support to rid Scotland of Macbeth's tyranny, or sorry, tyranny. A, a tyrant, of course, is a cruel and oppressive ruler who is unjust and unfair. <clears throat> so when they call Macbeth a tyrant, and they do several times, he fits that definition, absolutely, by this stage of the game. Shakespeare creates a sense of increasing hatred and fear of Macbeth. We also see the beginnings of opposition, supported by the pious and holy English king, King Edward, who has a healing ability, who is said to you know, be able to heal. Uh, like Duncan is a stark contrast to the evil, the maligned Macbeth. So again, we have natural kings like this holy English king, Edward, and the natural king, Duncan, who um, are seen in positive lights and are contrasted by this evil Macbeth. So again, this seems to suggest that, again, the natural kings um, will be better leaders than unnatural kings. Okay. Again, reiterating the whole idea of the chain of being and the divine right of kings. Act for scene one. In this scene, we um, we see Macbeth's second set of prophecies. As we know, he intends to go back to the witches to get some updates. Macbeth's wit sorry visit to the witches brings further pro uh, prophecies. There are three of them in the shape of three ghosts or apparitions. The first is an armed head um, with a helmet on that warns him, beware of Macduff. The second ghost uh, is that of a bloody child who tells him that he need fear no man of woman born. Now this gives him this great security that is going to make him, you know, not even fear death or fate or you know, he's, he's going to make some decisions here because he is going to be filled with confidence. And the third apparition is a child crowned with a tree in his hand that promises that he shall not be defeated until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane Hill. So again, this feeds his ego. It makes him feel like he is invincible. Nothing can harm him. Macbeth asks to know more about the future. The witches present a procession, a procession of eight steward kings presided over by Banquo, and they all look like him, right? Um, let's take a look here at this little note here. Each of the eight kings, the eight ghost kings, look like Banquo, as we've uh, established. Um, and that, is, that represents the Stuart dynasty. Uh, again, this is a tip of the hat of respect to King James, who was said to be descended from Banquo. So the story goes like this. It is believed that Fleance escaped to Wales um, and married a Welsh, sorry, a Welsh princess just get a little bit 
uh, yeah, married a Welsh princess. Their descendants, uh, sorry, re descendant, returned to Scotland and became Lord Stuart, who was then the founder of the Stuarts, uh, the monarchs of Scotland. And then again, as I've explained, King James was the sixth king of Scotland, but he became, but he became James I of England. There wasn't another James that was a monarch. And so he became the first James of England. All English monarchs from that point on are indeed descendants of this Stuart line to this day. So the fact that these eight apparitions um, continue uh, down the line is actually a pretty good prediction. If that is true. Yeah. All right, let's keep going here. Act four, scene two. Ross comforts Lady Macbeth that her husband's flight to England is not cowardice, but that Macduff knows what's best, um, what to do. Now, the reality of this, though, is he did not think this through very well. He is trying, Ross is trying really hard to just comfort Lady, Mac, uh, Lady Macduff, but the reality is Macduff did not think this through very well. He himself was perhaps a bit too trusting, um, thinking that Macbeth couldn't be that much of a monster to kill innocent people. But as we know, that is going to be his third great crime. As Ross leaves, a messenger arrives and tells her to flee. Again, this increases the suspense, right? But it is too late, as Macbeth's soldiers burst in and murder her and her son. Yeah, his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that are in the castle in his line. This domestic scene shows the innocent mother and child in a tender moment, preparing the way for a new phase of Macbeth's slide into evil deeds. She believes that innocent people do not need to defend themselves. So she here is actually being too trusting as well. I've done nothing wrong, she says. Why do I need to be afraid? But then she realizes, actually, in this world, in our Scotland right now, where to do harm is often laudable, laughable, and to do good sometimes accounted dangerous folly. So again, we have a reiteration of this appearance versus reality. Fair is foul and foul is fair. So she's acknowledging here, it doesn't matter whether she's innocent or not. People are getting killed. Like regardless. Act 4, scene 3. Macduff urges Malcolm to return to Scotland to overthrow Macbeth. So he's there with, with, with a purpose. Malcolm, however, must prove that he is not too trusting, right? He thinks that it's quite possible Macduff has been sent by Macbeth and is going to be a spy. In fact, Malcolm later on ex explains how Macbeth has tried, you know, to do that. Um, so Malcolm tests Macduff's loyalty, fearing that he intends to lure him into Macbeth's power. Yeah, so... So he's testing him. He must make sure um, that he is not going to be, um, to make the same mistake as his father did, right? In being too trusting. So Malcolm proves here that he will not be too trusting like his father was. He's gonna be a really good king. He is, he is more balanced. When he can see that Macduff is genuinely loyal, he takes back his self-slander and tells Macbeth, sorry, Macduff, that he is ready to invade Scotland. And that, not only that, but that England is going to help. Ross also arrives with the dreadful news of the massacre of Macduff's family. And this increases their determination to destroy Macbeth. Now, this is an important, uh, an important point. <clears throat> we know this is the third great crime, right? The, um, the third great crime. But it also allows for Macduff to name himself to be the arch rival, the nemesis of Macbeth. And so, you know, by, by so announcing this, he says, Macbeth is mine. I'm going to kill him. Like, let my hand be the one that takes that man's life. How dare he do this? And so 
um, it prompts him to, to make that a priority. Suspicion and mistrust are now part of Macbeth's life. Macbeth's last evil deed, the third great crime, the killing of Macduff's family, uh, yeah, the slaying of Macduff's wife and children, prompts Macduff to revenge. Revenge is seen as a healthy treatment of the disease caused by Macbeth. So he says, let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. So in other words, the fact that he killed your family, let's use that as something that can help us cure, right? So Macbeth is a disease in Scotland that must be cured. What is the cure? The cure is to um, put the chain of being back into the proper, um, into proper order. Yeah, to cure this deadly grief. Deadly is right. Act five, scene one. Now, it's important to note that by this point, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are sleeping in separate chambers of the castle. So possibly this could mean a complete breakdown of their marriage. For whatever reasons, though, Lady Macbeth is seen sleepwalking in a different chamber. Um, now, the other thing to note is that it is possible that this was you know, just a, a common occurrence as many kings and queens did have separate chambers. Lady Macbeth sleepwalks, watched, sorry, watched by a doctor and a waiting woman. She seems to be trying to wash imaginary blood and we know that this is imagery. It represents her guilt. She is so full of guilt that she's actually gonna lose her mind because of it, she's gonna go crazy. Um, and dreaming about the terrible crimes that she and Macbeth have committed. So again, this could be a, a symptom of PTSD um, in the form of flashbacks. She keeps dreaming. She keeps, you know, thinking about these, these crimes over and over and over again. And she cannot get these thoughts out of her mind. Not even when she's like sleepwalking, right? All right. The audience may regard the distressed Lady Macbeth as an evil person justly suffering from conscience or as a sadly wrecked person deserving sympathy. Right, so we did talk about this as we uh, discussed this section. Um, she's, just, she's just such a pathetic story figure that we do, you know, or we might have some sympathy for her, but maybe not. The doctor cannot help as this disease is beyond my practice. Certainly in medieval times, the idea of psychology um, or talk therapy wasn't even invented. So all he could do was heal diseases of the body. And she knows there is nothing she can do to recover her innocence and peace of mind. Yeah, she says, uh, look, all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. The stench of blood is so strong, I am so guilty, that it can never be washed away. That is in fact how guilty she feels. And it is this incredible guilt that just cracks her mind and throws her over the edge. Act five, scene two. The Scottish thanes march to join Malcolm and the English army near Burnham Wood. They discuss the rumors that many of Macbeth's forces are deserting him. So they have deserted Macbeth and they are then you know, technically traitors, but not to the natural king, not to Malcolm. And so the fact that they have deserted Macbeth is a huge deal. If Macbeth caught them, they would be killed. They would be hanged. Um, being noblemen, they would certainly be hanged. But that is uh, something that they willingly take a chance on because they are so dedicated to putting a natural king on the throne. Yeah, so is it better to be loved or feared? So this is the question we asked when we examined um, Niccolo Machiavelli. He seemed to suggest that it's much better to be feared than to be loved. But in this case, we see that it would have been better for Macbeth to be loved than feared. Now, some critics have suggested that this is a subtle 
um, like a subtle comment on Shakespeare disagreeing with the Machiavellian doctrine. As the opposition against him grows stronger, Macbeth's power seems to fade. This is summoned up, or sorry, summed up by Angus, who says, his title hangs loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Again, we have some clothing imagery here, and it's designed to show us how um, Macbeth, to everyone else by this point, looks like a dwarfish thief. Again, suggesting he stole the crown, right? But he doesn't, he doesn't fit the clothes because he's not a true natural king. Macbeth is furious at the desertion of his thanes, but he reassures himself with confidence that he is apparently invincible. Nothing can touch him. He is informed of the approach of the English and arms himself. Yeah, gets his, his armor ready and um, his swords. The doctor, though, reports that Lady Macbeth, um, her health is deteriorating. For the first time, Macbeth shows signs of some panic and uncertainty as he senses events are running beyond his control, particularly, you know, this whole scene with his, his wife. His wife is reportedly more distressed and his followers are deserting him. He is increasingly alone and losing his will to go on. Now, again, this increasing isolation is part of Shakespeare and Aristotle's definition of what tragedy is. And we need this to help establish that Macbeth is indeed a tragic hero. So he suggests, I have lived long enough. By this point, he is feeling very, very little. Life is just like slow moving and monotonous. It doesn't even have any real meaning to it, right? He suggests. Um, and he also, you know, talks a little bit later about his wife when he finds out that she died, um, that he, he, wish, he wishes that she would have died after so that he could actually feel some feelings. He feels very little. Now, again, um, it, that might be a symptom of PTSD, right? As we've established, people who do experience great trauma in their life do have symptoms of numbness and not being able to feel any emotion. Um, okay. Act five, scene four. At Burnham Wood, Malcolm and the Scottish Thanes join forces. Every man is ordered to cut branches to use as camouflage. Now, apparently this was a fairly common practice in war strategy. Um, however, the fact that Malcolm orders this to be done shows that he is a strategic king, you know, asking his army to be camouflaged. We see soldiers disguised as trees. So again, here we have Malcolm. Let every soldier hew him down a bough, a bough of tree, and bear it before him. This is a reminder of the witch's prophecies and the equivocation the telling of half-truths within uh, within them. They have neither meant what they seemed to mean nor what Macbeth wanted them to. Yeah. Um, appearance versus reality. Again, fair is foul and foul is fair. Macbeth is confident, though, still, even though, you know, it, it looks like this is an unwinnable situation. He still holds on um, arrogantly to his self-confidence um, that he can survive the attack on Dunsinane. Satan brings news of Lady Macbeth's death, her suicide actually, and makes Macbeth feel more pessimistic. So again, he says she should have died hereafter because he doesn't feel anything. Not, he doesn't, not only does he not feel anything, he doesn't have time to even address this because the army is closing in on, on him, right? So yeah, he, he feels more pessimistic, certainly. He feels nothing, really, by this stage. Is is he a full, you know, full on, um, experiencing full on PTSD? Is he a sociopath? He certainly is some kind of a monster. 
Um, the quote he says is, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. And then he says, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. So suggesting that life is hopeless with no meaning. A walking shadow, a shadow actually was a word used to describe an actor. So he says, you know, life is meaningless. We're just all actors and in the end we just die. So he he clearly has no um, connection to emotion by this stage of the game. Again, quite quite likely PTSD. The audience may, oh sorry, Macbeth feels more pessimistic. He is shocked to hear a report though that Burnham Wood is moving toward the castle. At this point, it kind of prompts him into a moment of anagnosis, where he realizes how his own decisions have created his destiny. And he also understands how his own actions have led him here. The audience may regard Macbeth as heroic in his reaction to events which are loaded against him, or glad that a murdering tyrant is about to get what he deserves. His trust in the witch's prophecies make him seem the victim of cruel fate rather than the controller of events. Does Macbeth's speech ending, at least we'll die with harness on our back, make him seem pathetic or heroic. Now this is an important point to note because we know, we've, we've discussed um, tragic figure, we know that the, the tragic figure, the protagonist, must retain some glimpse of his former glory in order to remain a tragic hero. So the fact here that he says, you know, they're coming at me, but I'm not gonna give up. At least I'll die with some armor on my back. I'm going to fight. I'm going to put up a fight and not let them just storm in here. So again, he, he does prove himself to be, um, to, to not give up, right? And he doesn't whine and he doesn't complain. He just says, I'm going to fight this. And so again, we do see him, you know, as holding on to at least some little um, bit of honor. Okay. Act five here. Malcolm orders his troops to throw aside their camouflage and then orders the attack. So we see here in Malcolm that he just takes control. He goes for it. He's going to be a good king. He is not just wise, but he is strategic and he is able to give um, good commands. But he is not going to be too trusting like his father was. Yeah, this shows he is now in charge. He is coming into his own um, power. Macbeth may have eliminated Duncan and Lady Macduff, but these violent acts have united the son, Malcolm, and the husband, Macduff, of his victims against him. So this is reminiscent of this idea of karma. But you could also say that the role of fortune or fortuna, the goddess fortuna, we did study this, or fate has something to do with this, right? This idea of what goes around comes around, yeah. Act five, scene six. Sorry, scene seven. The battle begins. Macbeth compares himself to a baited bear. So again, he feels chained and trapped like a baited bear being attacked. He quickly and easily kills Seward's son and uses this as... Um, proof that no one can kill him. No one born of woman can kill him. And he even says to Seward's son, you were born of woman, therefore you can't kill me. He's quite arrogant by this point, eh? Macduff tracks the tyrant down as the castle surrenders. So again, this question, is it better to be loved or feared? Again, this castle, the people who are working for Macbeth, they just quickly give up the castle. It surrenders. They should be fighting to protect Macbeth, but that's not the kind of situation he has created. They just feared him and did not love him. They weren't going to be um, truthful to him, right? Um, and victory is almost complete, yeah. Now that they have the castle, um, 
all they need to do now is take Macbeth. Macbeth knows that he is facing some impossible odds, describing himself as desperate and savage, like a bear tied to a stake. He clings, however, to his misplaced trust in the prophecies, unaware that the supernatural forces that tempted him were actually not on his side. Yeah, so I, it's kind of ironic here that he is trusting of the witches. You would think he wouldn't be too trusting as that's what got the first king um, killed, right? So he clings to the misplaced trust in the prophecies, unaware that those forces were not on his side. Do we admire his belief in winning or pity him as a defeated, as defeated and deluded? I think it's a little bit of both. He is definitely a victim of the witches, but certainly some critics argue that he, he, he is in charge of his own decisions and, you know, could have fought his, against his wife. Um, he could have made some different decisions. Hmm. What do you think? Act 5, Scene 8. Macduff fights with Macbeth and strikes terror in the tyrant's heart when he tells him that he was not of woman born, but delivered surgically or by cesarean. So this again here adds to Macbeth's moment of anagnorsis, where he realizes how his decisions have created his fate. He was too trusting of the witches, and now this is his destiny. Again, Macduff has his moment to um, get revenge. He has announced he is, you know, Macbeth's arch rival, his nemesis, and he's going to go for it. Macbeth, though, resolves to fight to the death. And as we said before, he retains some honor in that he doesn't give this, he doesn't give up. So we respect him a little bit here. And we need to because of, you know, the definition of a tragic hero or tragic, uh, tragic figure. Macbeth can be viewed in various ways in this scene. Is he pitiful and dignified, facing everything that is stacked against him and remorseful about what he did to Macduff's family? I'm not sure he's entirely remorseful. I'm not sure he feels anything. I think on an intellectual level, he, he knows that he should be. Um, and he says here, my soul is too charged, too much charged with the blood of thine already. So he acknowledges this, but does he actually feel anything anymore? I'm not sure that he does. Or should we see him as a miserable complainer to whom fate has, has been unfair? Well, the reality here is he does not complain. He actually presents himself as quite brave and courageous. Yeah, he's not afraid. And he says he's not going to die like the Roman. Like he's not going to commit suicide, um, which actually contrasts Lady, Lady Macbeth, who does commit suicide, right? So again, here we see that he has retained some of his original previous honor in that he doesn't complain, he doesn't give up. He shows himself to be quite brave and courageous, even though things look impossible for him. Okay, Act 5, Scene 9. Malcolm and his army are victorious. Macduff enters carrying Mac Macbeth's head. So we, we've commented on this before. This is quite grotesque, but standard treatment for some traders at the time, medieval times, right? And Malcolm is hailed as the next King of Scotland. Order is restored to the kingdom that has suffered from one man's ambition. Again, here we see ambition as Macbeth's tragic flaw, or hamartia, hamartia, uh, some people pronounce it. And the tempting of an untrustworthy supernatural force, the witches. So we established this before as well. Is this a satisfying conclusion? It absolutely is, because all is well. The chain of being is restored and we now have um, peace in Scotland. The natural king is on the, um, is on the throne and all will be well. In fact, they suggest the time is free, meaning freedom from tyranny. All right, so that's the end of our summaries 
um, section here. Again, in preparation for that final unit test, you might want to re-listen to this video. There are a number of hints that I've dropped here um, in preparation for that final unit test. If you've been paying attention and been doing the work, you are going to do quite well on that final test. All right.